What's up everybody, this is Zoya, the Russian Korean. So I know that I make a lot of game related content, but uh, in the beginning of every video, I always say, you know, this is Zoya, the Russian Korean, and a lot of times people kind of wonder what that means, why I'm saying this in the first place, and I know that it's completely not related to gaming content. There is a reason and a history behind it, and uh, I've made a few videos about just my experience as someone who is Russian Korean, and you can definitely check out those videos. But in this video, I just wanted to talk about I guess a little more seriously about like how I even came about, like why I am a Russian Korean. Why is it that there are people like me or why is it that specifically in my case, how did that happen? What's the story of my family? In my previous videos uh, related to this topic, you guys expressed some interest in, I guess, my experience and also shared some of yours. So I thought, you know, why not, why not make a video about it? Another reason for why I feel like I could make this video is because it's a unique story and uh, I am not claiming to be or not pretending to be like a spokesperson for all Russian Koreans. Like that's just, that's, that just would be very dishonest. And also I feel like there are lots of different experiences among Russian Koreans and uh, even Sahalin Koreans specifically. And I will get to that in a second. But I just wanted to share my family's experience and I guess just how historically they ended up in Russia. Another reason why I was thinking about making this video for a while, and actually I have been thinking about this even before I had my YouTube channel, I was thinking about how how can I share these stories and these experiences, I guess, with the world? Um, and at that time I didn't really have any means. Now that I have a YouTube channel, I feel like even though it's small, right, I can still share it and put it out there so that those of you guys who are watching, but now that I have the channel, I can actually like I guess make a video and then just put it out there because a lot of what I'm going to talk about is maybe very briefly mentioned in history books and on some like historical websites and it's a lot of these things sadly are anecdotal. The reason why is not because these things are not true. It's because and I mean that's the one of the controversial parts is that history ignores just has has been ignoring these stories for a while and there's a reason there's a political reason behind it it's a sad state of events in a way that like the experience of a group of people extremely grievous experience is slowly being forgotten why because it's inconvenient and i will make that conclusion at the end also but basically to sum it up is that because these people who were in the heat of those events most of them have passed away there's really nobody to like attest as a first witness, I guess. And so it all gets passed down through, through like younger generations such as me. And we can only attest to what we were told by our grandparents and parents. And uh, yeah, very sadly, there are not a lot of those because actually, even though there were a lot of people who went through these experiences, similar experiences, I should say. Uh, they didn't always choose to share those with their children and grandchildren just because of how, how just tragic those things were and not a lot of people want to, like, remember it. And so with that being said, before I get into the details, I want to make a few disclaimers. As I already said, this video is going to be about the experience of my family, not every Sahalin Korean out there, okay? Not every Sahalin Korean, let alone Russian Korean, had the same exact experience, so please don't take my word as like this overarching, I guess, narrative for all Russian Koreans, that's just not true. I'm talking about my family and a lot of other families had very common, very similar experiences. I, I should say the experience of my family is rather common, but not, I wouldn't say that it's like representative of everybody. So that's number one. Number two, please don't think of this video as either anti-Japanese or anti-Russian. And if you keep watching, you will understand what I'm talking about. But the history of my people has a lot to do with Japanese imperialism and the Soviet Union. So yeah, um, a lot of those things are very kind of yikes kind of moments. And uh uh, a lot of people think that when you talk about those things, you automatically hate Japanese, you automatically hate Russians, and it's like, no, no, okay? 
I want to talk about this in a historical context. I am not anti-Japanese, I am not anti-Russian, and this video is not meant to offend any Japanese or Russian people, like, or Korean people for that matter. Like, it's the experience of my family, it happened, that's all I'm saying. And my third and final disclaimer is that uh, in this video I will talk about some disturbing stories as well as share some potentially disturbing photos or pictures that I have found. So uh, yeah, just just letting you know ahead of time. And so with that being said, here is, uh, I guess, my plan for this video. I will first just talk about me a little bit and then uh, the special case of Sahalin Koreans. And then I'll talk about my family as well as share some stories and make try to make some sort of conclusion out of this. This video is definitely by no means all-encompassing, so uh, if you have any more questions or comments at the end of the video, just uh, please let me know in the comment section. And yeah, I'll try to respond, and if there are a lot more questions that you guys have, I could make another video just answering those, but yeah. I'll try to keep things as um, lighthearted and casual as possible, <laughs> um, but, you know, history is history. I'm not gonna try to sugarcoat anything, so, uh, yeah, just letting you know. So a quick summary of me. I was born in Russia in a place called Yuzhno-Sakhalinsk, which is a capital, I guess you should say, of a island in Russia, in the very eastern part of it. It's not the most eastern part, but it's very much in the east. Beyond that is like the Pacific Ocean. Many people confuse this island, they think it's Japanese. And uh, some people <laughs> some people uh, still want to believe that it is Japanese. And uh, it's not Japanese, it's a Russian island at this point. Anyways, because I was born on that island, I am a Russian citizen and I was born in Russia, I was raised in Russia, but I wasn't really raised on the island. I lived there until I was maybe four or five years old, and then my family moved to Moscow, and that's really when, where I, uh, I would say I grew up. But even though I was born in Russia and raised in Russia and speak Russian, I don't look like one. And the reason why is because racially, my parents are both Koreans and so were my grandparents and great great parents and so I am pretty much like you, you can imagine just like a Korean person just born in Russia basically so despite being culturally Russian and I mean like people get all uppity about like culturally ethnically and all that stuff but basically I was born and raised in a Russian culture but I don't have any Russian blood in me but you know I guess in our global world people usually don't like are not that surprised because like come on you know there are lots of people who immigrated from one country to another and then they had kids in that country and so now they you know are assimilating into that new culture so you know it's a process that many people are familiar with but uh for my family specifically for my korean family in russia right was this the product of direct kind of honest straightforward immigration uh, it wasn't. So let me explain. When people talk about Russian Koreans, they usually actually talk about two different kinds of Russian Koreans. So one is the Koreans who were born in Russia, like me, and we're also talking about Russian-speaking Koreans. So those Koreans were not necessarily born in the Russian territory, but what was at that time the Soviet Union. So even though there were a lot of uh, Koreans who migrated to the Soviet Soviet territories, I guess, around Russia, or you know, what you would consider modern-day Russia, places like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, they weren't born in Russia, but they were all Russian speakers, so they had to learn Russian because it was all part of the Soviet Union and the, the main language there was Russian. And so even when you're talking about Russian Koreans, you really, it's, it's, a, it's an umbrella term for a lot of different kinds of people. And the people that I'm going to talk about today that my family is from are the... Sahalin Koreans. That's like the general term for Koreans who live in Sahalin. But there's a difference between the Sahalin Koreans and uh, some of the other Russian-speaking Koreans in general, or even Russian Koreans in general, is that most Sahalin Koreans, when they came to the island, they did not come there willingly. They were displaced there by, or they were forcefully put there, right, which we could say they were displaced, dislocated from Korea by the Japanese imperial system, I guess, before and during the Second World War, which was like the early to mid-1900s. So here's my extremely simplified 
explanation of that history. The Japanese Empire was working on expanding its territories and part of those expanding territories was the southern part of the Sahalin Island. So they were occupying that part of the island and uh, that part in particular was very rich in coal and uh, had a, just had a lot of natural resources and so the Japanese Empire kind of exported I should say or like dislocated a lot of the colonies including the Korean colony, into the uh, Sahalin island. I, I should say not including, but especially the Korean colonies, into that island so that they were put to forced labor in the uh, Japanese coal mines on the island. Another thing they also did was entice uh, a lot of the Korean people with kind of false promises of getting rich and easy easy money if they immigrated to the island that they would be able to work there and uh, earn a lot and then come back to Korea and so kind of get rich that way. They made a lot of false promises and uh, that way they really attracted people to come not just forcefully but also willingly to try to make a fortune so that they can bring it back to their family but the whole reason why they did it is because they needed to run the economy on the island and so they they needed people to do it right and so both uh forcefully and uh, cunningly they uh, brought a lot of korean people onto the island now the koreans themselves who came they as far as i'm aware none of them was planning to stay there like forever it was all very temporary and that's what Japan kind of promised. This is temporary. You go, you work, we pay, and then you come back, you'll be fine. Of course, that was not the case because even though people were thinking that they were going to come home after working for some time on the island, once the war was over, the Japanese basically just ditched their colonies there and left. They were promising to bring them back and of course as many people will attest to this it never happened. The Japanese abandoned their colonies and then uh, the Soviet Union came in took over the southern part of the island and so essentially the Koreans that were there who were thinking they were going to come back home they were stuck on the island and thereby the Soviet Union. And so many families got separated because of this. A lot of the people who came without their families to work on the island, they were stuck there and they died on the island without their families ever being aware. And unfortunately, a lot of those people, uh, nobody knows actually what happened to them because by the time that the borders opened up again, the Soviet Union fell apart and, you know, uh, communications began again, it was too late. A lot of those people already passed away and there was almost no way to trace them. There were some people whose records were somehow recovered and uh, I've read some articles about this but I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people who just died and their family has no idea, no idea what happened to them. And so that's kind of the special case of the Sakhalin Koreans. The, the reason why I'm saying it's special is because a lot of the non-island Russian Koreans or Russian-speaking Koreans, they immigrated a lot of times even before the Japanese imperialism. So they were there a lot longer and they also immigrated willingly, whereas uh, a lot of the most, I, I should say, Sakhalin Koreans did not come willingly and certainly didn't come to stay there. So they, it, it was like a product of both imperialism and war and communism and everything just combined together and these people just got caught in the middle. And so in a way, you know, I am a, I guess you could say I'm a third generation Russian Korean, right? Because my grandpa who came to Sahalin, you could call him first generation. He wasn't born there, but he came. Then my parents were born in Russia, so they're the second generation. And then I was born there, right? from parents who were already born in Russia, so I'm a third generation. I guess you could say that I'm a pretty direct product of the Second World War and also Japanese imperialism. So that, I guess, is just the general background of how most Sahalin Koreans ended up on the island in the first place. But now I just wanted to talk about my family and, I guess, how <laughs> how we came about. So first I want to talk about my dad's side and then my mom's side. On my dad's side, my grandparents are from the Ulsan, Busan area, which is like the southern, the 
southeast part of South Korea. My grandpa was from the Ulsan area and my grandma was from the Busan area. My grandpa was the youngest son in the family and uh, he decided to come to the island, uh, to Sahalin, in order to try to make some money again because of the false propaganda by the Japanese Empire. And so he came there by himself at first, and then my grandma, so his wife, she uh, joined him a little later. And their children, they were born in Sahalin at that point. So what happened was the Koreans, because there were so many of them there, they uh, created these kind of small communities and they lived together. They all spoke Korean and kind of separated from everything else that was going on. As far as I know, from the stories that my dad told me and my aunts told me as well, it was a very simple life, but also a pretty difficult life. It uh, A lot had to do with, you know, farming and just keeping yourself and your family alive. <laughs> How should I say it? I guess that's the best way I can put this. My dad's family was pretty big and uh, my dad actually has a lot of sisters, so I have a lot of aunts. But my dad in my family is the only son, not because they didn't have sons, but because all the other sons died. So he's the only surviving one. Actually, the interesting part for me when I was a kid, I like I went to kindergarten and I assumed that everyone <laughs> went to kindergarten, but then when I asked my dad if he went to kindergarten, he said he never went to kindergarten. And I was kind of surprised and I was wondering why. And he said that the reason why he didn't go to kindergarten is because my grandparents, before they had my dad, they had some other sons and some of them, they reached a certain age and then passed away. But some of them, they never even like grew up enough for them to even go to kindergarten. And so uh, at some point they had a son, I believe at some point before they had my dad. And so that boy, he grew up enough to be like kindergarten age. And so my grandparents who really wanted to invest in their only at that point surviving son, they sent him to kindergarten because it's like uh, for them as Koreans on the island. At that point, by the way, it was already the Soviet Union. So the Japanese empire had left. I'm sorry if I'm causing any historical confusion, but okay, they had a son during the Soviet Union and he grew up enough to go to kindergarten. They really wanted to do the best for him. So they were like, we're gonna send him to kindergarten. He's, uh, he's, he's gonna get all the education that he needs and proper upbringing. So they sent him to kindergarten and uh, one day the kids were playing outside and he fell, I believe, into uh, a stream of water and the kindergarten teachers did not see that happening at all. So he died in kindergarten. And so when my dad was born, a lot, a lot later, he was the youngest, the last child from my grandparents. Uh, they did not send him to kindergarten. And so as you can imagine, life was very rough. They mostly did farming. They had very little. Uh, you can imagine kind of like a peasant kind of life. But because it was the Soviet Union, all the children had to join school once they reached uh, school age. So my dad and uh, all of his sisters, they went to the local schools, which were Russian schools. And so even though they were growing up in those Korean uh, kind of isolated villages, once they went to school, they learned Russian, they made Russian friends, and then they kind of became like russified or russianized i don't know how to say it basically at that point they started assimilating into the surrounding kind of russian majority and uh, my dad he still speaks some uh korean that uh, he spoke as a child that korean by the way is called Mal, which is like not your regular korean it's the Koreans that they spoke like a hundred years ago, kind of. And most people already don't speak it because like, again, it's very archaic. And people like my dad who do still speak it, they are kind of embarrassed to speak it because they believe it's not like proper Korean, you know. But in reality, that's how they spoke like a very long time ago. So yeah, I'm not going to get into like too much detail. That's basically the background story on my dad's side. Now talking about my mom's side, her family actually comes from a town that is kind of right on the 38th parallel. So these days it would be considered North Korea. But back then there was no North, there was no South, it was just one, you know, Korea. And so, um, yeah, her family is from the Northern side. My mom's family actually was quite well-to-do. So I believe my great 
great grandma, right? When she was a kid, she was carried around because、uh, I guess they were well to do, and so the children, the girl, shouldn't touch the ground, you know, as she's walking. So somebody had to carry her to places. But the interesting part was that my great great grandma, she was a Christian. Yeah, at that time in Korea, they already had Christians. And、uh, I mean, it was early stages of it, right? It's not like the Christianity that you see in Korea today, right? It was very different back then. It was, of course, a lot more rare. And so my great great grandma, she kind of handpicked. That's what my mom told me. She handpicked a husband for my great grandmother for her only daughter because、uh, my great grandpa he was a Christian, so she picked him to be a husband for her daughter. So my great grandpa he actually was a deacon. At this、uh, church, their local church there. But then the Japanese fascist empire comes in and、uh, starts to、uh, colonize the area and also persecute、uh, local Christians. They raided a lot of churches and arrested a lot of the、uh, local church leaders, such as like pastors and deacons and such. And they would throw them in jail. And that's exactly what happened to my great grandpa. His、uh, church's pastor got arrested, and he got arrested too as a deacon. And in jail, they were、uh, tortured and beaten, and、uh, that's the reason why、uh, the pastor of the church actually died in prison. But because the pastor died, they released my great grandpa because I guess at that point the church was dead. And、uh, once he got released, my great great grandma, right? Um, she、uh, was fearing for her daughter's and her son-in-law's life, so she sent them to Sahalin. And the reason why she sent them to Sahalin, like she could, I guess, send them to other places. But when I was talking about this to my mom, she believes that the reason why she sent them to Sahalin was because, like I said earlier. Most people believe that the Sahalin settlement was very temporary, so they had a higher chance of coming back to Korea after like things kind of slow down and die down a little bit, which of course never happened. But still,、uh, she sent them to Sahalin, hoping that they will be safer there than on mainland Korea, and、uh, they had a chance of coming back. Unfortunately, of course,、uh, they were never able to. Come back, and so my great great grandma was by herself when the division, the North and South division in Korea, happened. And、uh, because her town chose to be with North Korea,、uh, she died basically homeless on the street by herself. As far as I know, I still have relatives in North Korea, but I have no idea what is going on with them or what's what's happening. For obvious reasons, but anyway, because my great grandparents moved to、uh, Sahalin, that's where my grandmother was born, and that's where my mom was born.、Uh, when my great grandparents moved to Sahalin, they had my grandmother already. So my grandmother was the only child from my great grandparents who was actually born in Korea, and then came. To、uh, Sahalin. So technically, if I look at it from my mom's side, then I am like a fourth generation Russian Korean. But if I look from my dad's side, then it would be the third. Let me talk about my grandmother for a little bit. So for that time, she was pretty highly educated. She spoke fluent Japanese. Of course, she spoke Korean too, and then Russian as well. She had a lot of jobs.、Uh, she was living in Sahalin. She started out as a teacher. At like a local Korean school, then she became a leader of a local Komsomol, which was like the Soviet organization for the youth. Then she got promoted to a radio station in Yurosahalinsk. But then she got married, had to leave the radio station, and she started、uh, working as a kindergarten teacher. And then after that, she worked at an art studio. She was an amazing artist, by the way. But interesting thing, I remember she always drew with her left hand. Like she was right-handed, but she drew with her left hand, and I was, and I asked her. I remember,、uh, like, Grandma, why do you draw with your left hand, but you do everything else with your right hand? She told me, actually, I can do everything with my left hand, but because there was this superstition among Koreans that, like, I don't know if it still, I don't think it still exists, but like, if the girl was left-handed, then she wouldn't get married. So if the gr- a girl showed early signs of being left-handed, they would just reteach her to do everything with her right hand. 
So she said, I just, so I'm ambidextrous, actually. I can do things with my left hand and with my right hand. And I was like, whoa. Later, I also found out that I originally actually was a lefty myself. But uh, I also got retaught to do everything with my right hand. But anyway, after working at an art studio, she got hired by a newspaper where she worked as a proofreader and an illustrator and uh, what else? Correspondent. She did a lot of stuff for that newspaper. And I even remember seeing a photo of her in different articles and stuff. And also remember seeing a photo of her. We had a photo at home of her with Mikhail Gorbachev. <laughs> Which which was so surreal for me because, you know, he had this, he had like the thing on his head. It was really surreal for me because it was like, you know, this guy that I see in textbooks and stuff. And then there is my grandma like right next to him. It was really cool, but also a little bit weird at the same time. During that time, she worked with the Communist Party, which means you know, no, no faith, no Christianity. She was in, I guess you could say an atheist or like she departed from faith until about maybe the 70s or the 80s when after all the trials and uh, I should say like sorrows of life brought her back to God. And uh, that's where she became a really sincere and uh, hardcore Christian. She was a big influence in my life. She raised me as a Christian, even though my parents weren't Christians when I was when I was a kid. Even in her last days, she was actually a missionary into the very remote parts of Russia. But uh, she got very sick there because it was very cold there. And then um, she passed away very soon after because she couldn't get over the illness. But yeah, that was uh, that was my grandmother and uh, my mom. She was born also on the island. But unlike my dad, who grew up in this Korean village, uh, she grew up in a city. So she doesn't speak any Koromal. And just like my dad, she graduated from a Russian school, went to a Russian university and then worked right in Russia. So like the Korean... Um, language was not necessary for life at all, pretty much. And uh, this is the reason why neither of my parents speak Korean today. She worked as a teacher and then she uh, got married to my dad. And then my brother was born and then I was born already after the Soviet Union fell apart. So yeah, that's the, um, again, the general background of uh, my mom's family. Now, there are some stories, I guess, that uh, I would like to share before I close in this video because I believe those stories are important, very difficult experience of um, at least my family and I'm sure of many other uh, Sahalin Koreans. Uh, they probably have very similar stories as well. Uh, and also those stories, they're, they're not mentioned anywhere. They are not in history books. They're not on any websites. I tried for my life to search for uh, the bombing that I will talk about. I couldn't find it. So yeah, I. I wanted to include those in this video and then maybe at some point I could do more research, find out maybe other people who have something similar. Uh, if you if you know any stories or if you also are a Sahalin Korean and uh, you are you know what happened to your family, please do share in the comments as well. I would I would love to know. But yeah, one thing I heard about my grandpa from my dad was that he had this like little radio thing. So uh, the radio that somehow caught waves of Korean radio, uh, even though he was in Sahalin. So sometimes he could kind of catch the wave, the Korean wave, so to say. And uh, he would sometimes listen to what was happening in Korea. And so because there was no communication with uh, their homeland, they really didn't know what was happening. And so that Korean radio was like this, you know, this treasure is the only way to find out what was going on. He would cry a lot listening to it. Another thing that he also had was like kind of like this like little handkerchief where he actually had uh, some Korean soil that he brought with him from Korea when he first came and uh, he kept it right in this handkerchief and sometimes he would just open it and just look at it and literally just cry. He wanted to go home really bad back to Korea but uh, he couldn't. And uh, that was really the only uh, the only keepsake that he had from his home. Now, he did eventually go back to Korea, but for about 50 years or so, probably even more than 50 years, he was stuck in Russia 
So yeah, my great my my grandpa actually uh, didn't really speak Russian at all. So I remember I remember my grandpa. He actually lived for a very long time. I believe he died. It w w I'm not sure exactly what his age was because it was very difficult for people to determine their actual age because when the Russians were registering everybody, there was this whole confusion with the Gregorian calendar and then also the Korean lunar calendar. So all the years were just mixed up. We believe that he died when he was about 103 years old, but uh, we're not sure. But anyway, he was very old when he passed away. But when he would come over to Moscow uh, when I was a kid, I remember like I couldn't really talk to him because I didn't speak Korean and uh, he didn't speak Russian. <laughs> One thing I remember him always doing, though, was uh, when he came uh, to Moscow, especially uh, our apartment was right kind of in front of the Moscow River, along the, along the bank of the Moscow River, I should say. And we had a balcony. We lived on like the third floor and the balcony was looking out right onto the river. So you could come out and just like see the river, right? And the other bank, the, the opposite bank. And so what my grandpa would do when he would come over, he would put a chair down on the balcony and just sit there and just watch the ferries that pass by on the river and like just the cars and people walking by and he would just sit there for hours. And when he was finally able to come back to Korea, and this is what I heard from my aunt because she was the one who was taking care of him when he came to Korea, uh, he, when he came over to her apartment also, when they brought him over to her apartment, they live in Busan right now. And so when my dad, when my grandpa was still alive, he would come over and again, they have a balcony. And at that time, uh, the their little town was still being built. So a lot of the mountains were still visible. Busan, uh, all of Korea is a very mountainous area. But in that area, especially, there, there are a lot of mountains. It's really beautiful. But uh, yeah, he would come out on the balcony and just sit there and just watch. But uh, at that point, he was not just watching the Moscow River. He was watching actually the land where he came from and uh, he was finally able to come back and so he passed away in Korea a few years back yeah so I guess he was able to come back but unfortunately that's not the I guess like the happy ending for uh, a lot of people who got displaced dislocated uh, in Sahalin because a lot of them just died on the island and nobody knows how, where, when. Yeah, that was actually the fate of a lot of people. And one last story I want to share in this video is um, it's a kind of a disturbing story, but I heard it as a kid from my grandma a lot of times. And the reason why I believe she told it so many times is because she knew, she knew it wouldn't get recorded anywhere because like... And I'll explain why I believe that it, it's not recorded anywhere. But also she believed it was important enough for like future generations to know, for me to know at least, and for hopefully some people to remember what happened so that it doesn't get completely erased. It's also the kind of story, it's not like your grandpa, grandma telling you this cute story from their childhood. It's the kind of story that like, if I were her, I'm not even sure if I would tell anyone because it's just, it's so traumatic that you kind of don't want others to know. But at the same time, if you keep, if she kept telling me the story so many times that I still remember it, even though I was a little kid when she told it to me, it was very vivid when she told it to me. Like, I believe it was real. It happened. And the reason why she told me this repeatedly was so that I know it for sure. I remember it. And even though it's painful, it was probably very painful for her to remember. She still shared it with me so that at least it stays in the memory of somebody. So what happened? When the Japanese lost the war, of course, they uh, they didn't exactly inform <laughs> their colonies that they lost, right? Because that's very humiliating. But what they did was like, okay, we're pulling out of here. We're getting out of uh the southern part of the island and we're gonna get you guys out too so that's what they promised to koreans and they gave them like a few locations where they should come and uh, where they would get picked up and then kind of shipped back or taken back to korea there is one location on top of a hill that uh there's actually a memorial there where they said the koreans should come 
and there's going to be a ship that's going to come and pick them up. And uh, lots of Koreans who kind of got the memo, they were like, yay, we're going back. They went on that hill so that they could see the ship coming from afar. And they waited for many, many days. And as you probably knew, as soon as I said they promised, uh, nothing, nothing came. Okay, The boat never came. And uh, a lot of Koreans died there waiting waiting to go back home. So there are lots of stories like this, okay? They're historical, they're real, and uh, there is a memorial for that. But the story that my grandmother told me, a similar story, but uh, a little bit a little bit different. It was at a different location. So the Japanese, and I'm going to say the Japanese, okay? And when I say the Japanese, I don't mean like Japanese today, because of course not. The, it's not the Japanese that live today. It was the Japanese imperialists back then that were that lost the war and then they just wanted to get out as quickly as possible. And they really didn't care about the colonies that were there. And so while they took out their own people from the island, they left the Koreans there, but they made some excuses saying, you know what, we're going to bring you back. And so another location that they gave was this train station. Like there's going to be a train that's going to come pick you up, take you to the coast. And then from there, you'll board a ship and then we'll uh, take you back home. So a lot of Koreans, Korean families uh, that got that memo, they came to the train station and they waited there for several days. And so my grandma's family, so her uh, mom, so my great grandma and her one little sister and one little brother, I believe, they were together at that train station. And then uh, they were waiting and waiting and uh, the train was not coming. And so they were just kind of sitting at the station waiting. But something happened that nobody expected because the Japanese abandoned that part of the island. The Russians, when they came in, the Soviet Union, when it came in, the first thing they did, and you can kind of find out this stuff on Wikipedia a little bit and maybe some of the articles. And I'm sure if I if I dig a little deeper, I might find some books and articles about this. But they did some kind of like preliminary bombing before they really moved in. So they bombed the area. And I think the excuse was that they thought that it was uh, it wasn't inhabited as, as in like they believed that all the Japanese left. And because there was no information of the colonized Koreans still being in the area, they just bombed the area and like they didn't know that there were people there, actually. At least that's one of the excuses, I think. But anyway, as uh, you may have guessed, the bombing happened right at that place where the train station was. And my grandma at the time, she was... Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what the age was, but I believe she was about 9 or 11 years old. It's so somewhere there. I, I would say from 9 to 13 years old. Somewhere there. And so she was very young. As her family was kind of waiting at the train station, just losing hope that this train would ever come, they see these airplanes above them. And then they're like, is this for us? No. And then the what they see is something is dropping from the airplanes and like that's from my grandma's perspective right she's a little kid little girl watching right and there are all these people around her with their baggage and stuff with their kids with their family just like sitting there waiting and then all of a sudden there's these things falling from the airplanes above them and uh those were not just things those were bombs so like the reality didn't like click they didn't realize that it was an air raid. And then by the time that they realized, the, the bombs were already falling. And so people were panicking because there are explosions around them everywhere. My grandma, she said, all she remembered was like, there are things just exploding around her. It was very loud. There's dirt everywhere. There is smoke and dust. She can't see anything. She said she just grabbed her younger sister and uh, her mom actually when that happened she must have like stepped away somewhere so she said when that was happening mom was not nearby so here's this 9 to 13 year old kid right with her younger sister and a toddler brother and the toddler brother is on her back and she just grabs her younger sister's hand and she says she just starts running. And uh, because the Sahalin also has kind of a landscape, very hilly landscape, the instinct for people is to run toward the hills, right? When like danger happens. And so as the bombing was happening, she said she just started running for the hill, the nearby hill. 
to kind of try to find safety. But as she was running, she said, the bombs are falling. She can't see anything. She can only see within like a small radius around her. And she said she sees other people running, bombs falling on top of people, blood, people exploding, uh, hands, feet, uh, just parts of bodies flying. One thing she remembers especially vividly was that, you know, people, they had children with them and uh, they carry their children on their backs. They like strap the children to their backs. And so uh, you can't really see your kid because obviously the kid is on your back. And so she said there was a mother running in front of her with a child on her back, but then uh, a bomb fell somewhere nearby and there were shards that uh, hit the child uh, on her back on the child's face and so his his face literally just got wiped out like it's just blood at that point you can't see the face like it was like whew, you know it, it was like in a cartoon like face just like gone and so the baby's dead but on the mother's back and the mother doesn't even realize because she's panicking and she's running she's running to safety and she doesn't even know that her baby just died so my grandma was running right behind that lady and she saw it and like she wasn't even thinking, she said. She was just running, running, running. And then she wasn't even thinking about trying to find her mom because at that point, like, how can she find her? She was just running. And then finally, she, I believe, God just protected her and uh, her siblings with her. They made it to the hill kind of safely. The raid at that point, I believe, stopped. Lots of people died. And uh, when she said she made it to the hill, he, she couldn't find her mom. So they believed that, you know, they believed the worst. But uh, thankfully, they actually were able to find each other a little bit later because the mom was also running and was looking for them everywhere. And then when she found them, like, you can imagine, <laughs> you can imagine what kind of experience that was, not just for my great grandma, right, who was just who lost her children there and or who thought she lost her children there and then finally found them and then also for my grandma who wasn't even really a teenager at that time and like brought all her siblings with her to the hill and like got reunited with my great grandma that's probably the most uh traumatizing and intense story uh that i heard from my uh grandma i mean she told other stories as well but i think that one was was uh the worst now later when internet came about and everything uh and i searched this a few years back and i searched this b before doing this video i still can't find information about that bombing now the reason why i believe that information is not just like publicly available is i mean there are multiple reasons but the number one reason i believe is because it's just historically it's just an embarrassment for both the Russian side and the Japanese side and nobody wants to remember that and I think it's one of one of those like if you let it die down people people won't know it even happened you just don't mention it you don't teach it you, you pretend like it never happened and then the people like my grandma like my like her siblings right uh, she passed away and then they most of them don't tell their children about it because it's just too traumatic of an experience and then because of that like Eh, it, it's like it never happened. I think in many ways it's a nuisance. It's hard to deal with if you if you are on the Russian side. Like, well, why did you bomb when there were clearly people there? But like, well, we didn't know that there were still people there. And then on the Japanese side, why did you leave these people? Why did you lie to them that you're gonna bring them back, tell them to come there, and then you never pick them up? Well, uh, this is the upsetting part for me because like. It was real. It happened. I would rather believe my grandma who told me this story so many times so that I remember it, so that I know it. And like, I would rather believe her than all the empty pages of Wikipedia or other places on the internet. They're going to probably deny what I'm saying, but I believe it happened. Now, do I think that history books are ever going to include this? No. And I mean, already there is kind of a trend in Japanese educational system. And I, I talked about this with some of my Japanese friends when I, uh, for about three years I was studying Japanese language. So I made some Japanese friends <laughs> and uh, I was talking to them about this stuff. 
And one of them actually was a Korean Japanese. So it was when uh, some of the Koreans, they moved to Japan during the imperialist time. And because they're like this really persecuted minority, they blended into the Japanese society. They got themselves Japanese names and uh, they, uh, they pretended to be Japanese and kind of just <laughs> you don't talk about the fact that you're Korean. So it's kind of like that. And I uh, said, so, yeah, there are lots of things like that where, uh, especially when it comes to very questionable things and very uh, violent and uh, inhumane things that the Japanese imperialist regime did to its colonies. The current generation just never learns about these things. But the fact of the matter is that people like People like me, right? I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for all that that happened. Like, you can't just deny it or pretend like it never happened or just ignore the fact or hope that people forget. Start making it sound like it wasn't as bad as you think. But yeah, I'm not going to ramble on about this. To conclude, I just want to say, like, I didn't cover everything, right? This was a very general video and it was mostly concerning my family and my family's experience and how, I guess, my family ended up in Russia in the first place. But my firm belief if that is that if no one records it, like even just a little bit, all right, even just share like in a video like this, right? I don't even know how many views this video is going to get, if people are going to share it, if people are going to talk about I don't know, right? But if no one does it, if no one makes any record of it, then it will literally just disappear. The people who know will act like nothing happened, and then people who don't know will never find out that it happened. And that's the sad thing about history. If no one records it, or if someone rewrites it, then it just sounds like things that actually happened never happened. And I personally don't want that to happen. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it for uh, this video. One thing I want to add, though, is that I'm not trying to make it sound like the Sahalin Koreans had it the toughest, okay, in the Japanese uh, empire. Like, definitely, probably not. But there were uh, experiences for sure among the Sahalin Koreans that attest to just how brutal and extreme that regime was. And if you want to find out more about what was happening with the Japanese Empire and the colonies. You can search. You can search. You can find, okay? There is information about other things, but there is not a lot of information out about the experience of the Sahalin Koreans, so that's why I wanted to share it, because it relates to me personally, and uh, I think also needs to be known. So if you've come this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. Uh, please share your thoughts in the comments section below. And uh, yeah, I think I'll just, uh, I'll just end this here. So... Uh, thanks so much for watching, and uh, I hope to see you next time.